Hello and welcome to Nosotros, the podcast about cultura, políticas y más. I'm your host, Elaine Ayala, the Metro columnist for the San Antonio Express News. And my guest today is Selena Moreno, the CEO and president of IDRA, the Intercultural, and I have to read this, Development Resource Association, which they say they never use because it's so long. You'll probably recall her name associated with another blockbuster organization, MALDEF, um, for which she served as a regional council and handled its policy and its litigation for the Southwest region. Welcome to Nosotros. Thank you so much, Elaine, for having me. It is your 50th anniversary. Congratulations to IDRA. Thank you. Um, I want to start with the figure of Jose Cárdenas and what he meant to the, the beginnings of IDRA and how he's looked upon um, today. We, um, we lost him many years ago now. Um, I remember writing his obit on that day and was so glad that it made page one. He was that important a figure. Tell us about him. So Dr. Cardenas for us is is still a guiding light. We, his vision um, it remains um, and his fire remains a guiding light for, for all of us at IDRA today. Um, but I think to tell the story of Dr. Cardenas, I have to start with the students that he, he so, um, you know, just expertly and passionately served. Um, so thinking about students in Edgewood, you know, the late 60s, you know, they were choosing classes at the time um, based on which classrooms had working air conditioning. Um, you know, they're... Which is so... It, that kind of memory hits you so hard about the status of schools at the time. It was a tumultuous time. It was a time of walkouts. That's right. And Edgewood, Edgewood ISD um, was not only one of the poorest, prop property poor school districts in San Antonio, but also in the entire nation. And so, you know, I think Dr. Cardenas really um, was inspired by um, the students who walked out in Edgewood ISD. I think he also was inspired by the parents like Demetro Rodriguez um, who and, and many others who joined together and took their case, right? They demanded better uh, quality schools um, for their children. They took their case all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court um, in the infamous case, um, Rodriguez versus SASD, um, which Thurgood Marshall, Justice Marshall said, was a betrayal of the Brown v. Board uh, of education decision, um, and and you know I think it was really heartbreaking for for um, all of those students and families because they they knew I mean at that time you had some school districts because our our schools are are funded based on property wealth you had some school districts that um, were could raise seven thousand dollars per student and across town and in, in places like Edgewood it was much lower like four hundred dollars per student. And, and so huge disparities. And you could see it in the classroom. The students felt it, right? The textbooks were subpar. Instead of a, t a typewriter, they had cardboard um, where they had sketched out a, the, the keys, and that was their typewriter. And so this was all happening in Dr. Cardenas' um, school and, and um, in, in his school district, Ed Edward ISD. And so Students demanded better, parents demanded better, and educators like Dr. Cardenas demanded better. And so when the U.S. Supreme Court um, issued that decision in Rodriguez, um, you know, Dr. Cardenas said, uh, I mean, I think about it and it gives me chills because to, to leave the superintendency um, and say, I'm going to start an organization from scratch. Um, and, and that's what he did, right? He, there was a $95,000 grant. He started an organization called IDR, well, called TEE that later became IDRA, um, from scratch in 1973. And he said, surely if we conduct research and, and advocate around school funding and let people know what's happening, because so many people don't know about these disparities, you know, we'll work ourselves out of a job in a few years. Um, we know that that didn't happen. And we are still, even though we've made such important gains, um, you know, we're still working to 
to ensure that schools are more equitably funded. Um, but that's kind of d- what Dr. Cardenas' vision was. He tr- he fiercely believed that all students mattered, not a single student is expendable, um, and that they should all have access to, to quality schools that would prepare them for college, prepare them for, for life. Um, and I think beyond just the funding, um, really believed in the qualities and assets of our community, of our families and students, so that we don't want you just to succeed and and have a successful life, but we we don't want you to um, have to leave your language behind, leave your culture behind um, in order to succeed. Um, and so IDRA and under Dr. Cardenas' leadership, not only um, you know, went and did such incredible advocacy. After the Rodriguez case, we had a long line of Edgewood, we call them the Edgewood school funding cases in Texas, um, that vastly changed how schools are funded. Um, you know, we're still, we're still fighting some of those battles, but, um, that disparity that I mentioned earlier, it was just significantly reduced. And that's thanks to the work of IDRA as expert witness um, to so many of the cases led by Maldev um, in, you know, throughout the 80s and 90s. And and I was fortunate to be um, in the 2000s, be part of of some of the more recent cases. The Rodriguez case um, must have been devastating, the the Supreme Court ruling. And uh, and uh, one of the things in in my reporting that um, Blandina Cardenas, no relation to Jose Cardenas, but what she said is that one of the failings of the case was the lack of data, and um, that Jose Cardenas was keenly aware of that. That he thought we need to build a case, we need to build the data sets so that. We can win in court. We can prove our case. Yes. And, you know, the, the Rodriguez case, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that education was not a fundamental right. And Which sounds so horrible, doesn't it? It is horrible. It is wrong. Um, it, it is. Many of us believe it is. It was wrongly decided then. Um, and it's still wrong. And it's still wrong. And Dr. Cardenas said, well, let's set out on a mission, um, you know, through this new organization to inform our community about um, school funding, which is can be a very uh, complicated topic. Um, but as I was, you know, mentioning a couple examples with the AC and the the fake type, the cardboard typewriter, right? It looks very real in, in students. You know, they might not know what all the for- formulas in school funding mean, but they can feel what is happening in their classrooms. And they know that what the resources that they have are different from what students on the other side of town have, right? They they inherently feel that. Um, and, and a Dr. Cardenas believe that all children are equal, that uh, you know, that all children have the right to learn, that all children can learn. Um, and, and so that we should invest in all children, um, in a way, um, that, that is appropriate and that, um, values who they are. And a- IDRA set out to research, to find ways to study what's happening in the classroom so that when Maldef went to court, they had expert witness from IDRA providing that crud- critical information. Dr. Cardenas testified in over 70 court cases. And so a part of that was research, but he was also very much involved in the behind the scenes litigation and legal strategy. Um, also very instrumental um, when, when we would have a favorable decision by the Texas Supreme Court in one of the line of Edgewood cases, IDRA was, um, you know, the first to be, uh, you know, in the Texas Capitol advocating um, for uh, more equitable laws that, you know, the, the court said, fix this uh, broken system. Um, and IDRA was there in the halls of the Capitol, um, people like Dr. Cardenas and also people like Dr. Albert Cortez um, advocating for a more equitable law. And, and so it was uh, the research, which is key. Um, everything we do is based on research, um, but also, you know, translating the research 
putting that research into the hands of lawmakers, into the hands of educators, and into the hands of, of families. And, pub- and the public in general, really. Um, besides the funding equity issue, IDRA has been involved in so many issues. I'd like you to tick down some of those, um, uh, not just the expert testimony portion, but those other issues that IDRA has focused on over the last 50 years. One of our other major founding issues in addition to school funding was um, bilingual education. Uh, not in necessarily in the way that we think about it now. Biling- bilingualism is cool now, um, mm-hmm. and everybody wants to be bilingual, um, which you know we, we should want for all of our children, um, but more as a civil right, um, because a lot of students were not um, allowed to be bilingual. They were, um, you know, number one, they would if they came to school not knowing any English, um, you know, but still taught. Uh, only in English, right, without bilingual education, um, you know, it, it immediately deprived them of a quality um, education. And so IDRA under Dr. Garnes' leadership um, wrote the first, helped write the first bilingual education law in Texas, um, helped write um, some of the first biling- strongest bilingual education laws in the country um, at the national level. Um, and I think it's, uh, you know, I, I think about it from a personal perspective. I mean, my my mom, like so many people in San Antonio, when they got to school not knowing any mm-hmm. um, any English, were punished or paddled for not um, speaking English, uh, and they really internalized that, and then did not teach um, you know their their children. That's right, uh, Spanish, and and I think you know we we're seeing a shift. Now, right, and I think that bilingualism is cool. For bilingualism sure, bilingualism is cool. Um, but I think there, there's still a lot of feeling of loss in our community here in San Antonio, um, because language is such a big part of our culture, um, and and so, you know, trying to reclaim that, I, I think, it's is been a profound loss that um, that also has come with profound um, resurgence in the language in so many ways mm-hmm. in. And um, it's been beautiful to see um, some of those same people who as children were were never taught. I just came back from Mexico City and went with a whole group of people different ages. And at the end of the trip, uh, one of the people that that didn't speak Spanish very well was taking over the conversation and <laughs> and uh, giving uh, giving directions to someone and um and so well, let her take it let her. <laughs> oh look at she's you. yeah okay girl <laughs> um one of the other figures I think of when I think of I D R A besides Jose Carneras who you have a nickname for but um is is Cuca and Cuca um, Robledo Montesel who was honored at your 50th anniversary recently, another very extraordinary person, a a figure of great prominence in the field of education. Tell us about her. So she is a, my personal Shiro. She has been a mentor to me. Um, You know, I think so many of us equate Dr. Maria Cucar Brother Montesel with the idea that all children matter um, and, uh, you know, this this fierceness, right, in, in that belief, um, you know, that, that our communities have something to bring. So we talked about, we talked about bilingualism, right, um, that they have language to bring to the table, that we have culture to bring to the table. Um, but, you know, when she, and, and she led IDRA for over half of its existence for 26 yes. years. Mm-hmm. Um, but, had been, you know, with IDRA for, for, you know, more than four of its five decades. 47 years. Who, who stays with one organization for 47 years? Obviously, someone who cares deeply about the mission of IDRA. And also, I think under uh, her leadership, there are so many people at IDRA who stayed for quite uh, you know, for for decades of uh, um, and spent their careers there because of the passion for um, what we do, but also um, you know because of that leadership. Um, you know, I, I mentioned at the, the celebration that 
uh, you know, Dr. Badamanta said, when, you know, when you have a conversation with her, you feel seen by her. Um, and, you know, that's one conversation. Um, and that doesn't matter if you're a university student or uh, a, uh, a K through 12, you know, one of one of the, uh, the tutors that we work with. Um, and so when you take one conversation and multiply it by those 26 years, you can just imagine that everything that IDRA um, has done uh, under under her tenure, um, you know, has been done with love and, and with the fierceness um, and that, that um, we're really proud to, uh, you know, to to highlight as, as part of our core identity um, under her tenure um, at Washington Post reporter called I love uh, this yeah they they called they called IDRA a gadfly organization um and I Dr. Robert Montes tells a story she had to look that up like what does that mean <laughs> a social gadfly so gadfly looks like a dragonfly but a mm-hmm. social gadfly um is somebody that rouses others to action for social justice and you know that is exactly what IDRA is about um you know even now right when we're uh, We've made such great gains. We're talking about bilingual education. Um, dual dual language schools have become, you know, more and more common, um, and and attractive to parents and attractive of to all parents. kinds of all backgrounds. But I think part of our gadfly nature to say, well, wait a second, let's look at the research. Eighty percent of students who are uh, learning English are not in dual language programs, right? We have to. You know, we love dual language programs. We have to make sure that more students are in those programs. But when you're only funding bilingual education through the lens of dual language programs, you are ignoring um, the 80 percent of uh, of English learners who are not um, in those programs. And so, mm-hmm. again, um, it's great for you know middle you class. You bring next- people back to the research. And to the at, civil rights, the, the core civil, civil uh-huh. rights purpose of why do we have bilingual education in the first place? It's so that all students can feel um, and be included and re- and have the ability to receive a high quality um, education. Another um, area where that's true um, is with the ed- education of immigrant students. And IDRA played a key role. Um, and I really can't think of many education civil rights cases coming out of Texas um, that where IDRA didn't play um, a key role as expert witness um, or, you know, behind the scenes legal strategist. Um, Plyler v. Doe, the U.S. Supreme Court case um, that last year turned 40 years old, um, you know, where the Supreme Court ruled that all students, regardless of their immigration status, have a right to a free public education. That was a, a key case um, that was litigated by MALDEF. And will be under attack. In Texas and other places. Well, it's interesting that you say that. So that's a key case litigated by Maldiv where IDRA provided the expert witness testimony. That case just, you know, just in the last few years, um, you know, what was mentioned by Governor Abbott um, here in Texas saying that maybe we should revisit that decision. Mm-hmm. Settled precedent, right? And we're seeing that, right? We're seeing settled precedent in, in several cases uh, that are being revisited. Um, that's why... You know, even though Texas was the first state in the country to pass the Texas Dream Act that allows undocumented students the right to have in-state tuition uh, rates, you know, the Texas Dream Act, we were the first ones here in Texas, but that is, again, every session after session has been attacked by certain yes. leaders um, in Texas, and in, it's been in court. And, and so even in 2023, um, IDRA was, you know, advocating in the conservative Fifth Circuit, uh, and we were lucky to be on the winning winning team in that case. But that was, um, you know, there was a case in 2023 where the Young Conservatives of Texas, um, you know, a, a group that wants wants to undermine the Texas Dream Act, tried after failing in the legislature, tried to to undermine the Texas Dream Act in, in court, and in, and. Fortunately, did not succeed, uh, and we were very proud of our legal team at IDRA um, for for being part. Uh, and we're always going to to protect the Texas Dream Act. We're always going to protect, um, you know, Plyler v. Doe. Um, and I think as a community, right, it's important to know our history because we do have, um, you know, we do stand on such amazing shoulders, like the shoulders of Dr. Jose Carnes and Dr. Maria Rupa de Montesel and and many others. 
um, but we have we have to um, fight to protect that legacy. And um, Guka also has another um, signature program of IDRA that mm-hmm. is almost always mentioned um, as uh, your most successful, at least. Um, uh, the most enchanting right away when you describe what's happened. And this is the youth tutoring program. Tell listeners about that program in a nutshell. So that program in, um, in part, uh, really came about. It's our flagship program, the Valid Youth uh, Partnership Program, or we call it VYP. Um, that program, you know, really came about because after some groundbreaking research that Dr. Maria, um, Robledo de Montesel, um, Led in, in 1986, which is, which was the first, um, study of dropouts in the state of Texas. And that really, sh- like, shined a light on the, how many students were being lost. And since then, um, because we do this study every year, um, we've, Texas has lost four million students. Oh God, that's, um, devastating. and that's so much, that's devastating loss potential. Um, and, and because of that study, it, um, the, the state of Texas changed their uh, their laws to to actually counting um, in, in a more transparent way, uh, mandating counts of dropouts. Um, you know, but we are we still have a lot a long way to go. Um, Latino and Black students are still twice as likely to drop out than white students. We are still losing one in four of every Latino student and, and of every Black student. And so the value Youth partnership is a program that targets students who are at risk of dropping out. So it's the older student who's maybe in high school? They're, they can be in middle school or in high school. Mm-hmm. And so these older older students that are at risk are placed in positions of leadership. And they are. Um, it's a cross-age tutoring program. So they are tutors of the little ones, of the elementary school students. And... You know, through that experience, right? They, uh, you know, they are hold, held accountable. They want to be good examples for the little ones. Um, they are seen. They see themselves as leaders that they are. Their schools see themselves as the leaders that they are. I get little chills whenever I hear about it. I mean, the transformation in these students, and I would love, you know, love for you to come and, and visit some of the classrooms. Um, you know, we've had this program, of course, here in San Antonio, starting in South San ISD, but have had this program, you know, in Brazil, in England, um, in California, New York. And it makes so much sense, doesn't it, that when you empower mm-hmm. a young student, who perhaps hasn't done well, but all of a sudden is looked upon with some authority, with some uh, sense of worth, that you are being employed employed to help this younger student out who may be a preschooler or first grade and you're helping that child read on their level that's right and that is an emotional interchange mm-hmm. um, whenever I hear about it I think oh my god well of course it's used in other countries it makes sense well and now we uh, IDRA um, has de- built on the the VYP, the Valid Youth Partnership model, um, and created a new program that is federally funded um, called Vision Coders. Um, and so it's the same concept, but it it brings in STEM. Um, so these are coders that are, are teaching coders. eighth graders. Wow, eighth graders teaching little kids. And I've gone into some of the classrooms and to see their coding, it, you know, it's over my head. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't <laughs> understand even how to start. <laughs> but they're coding uh, g- educational games, right, for the little ones, for their elementary um, school mentees. Um, and they're helping them with their schoolwork through the use of coding. And so, um, you know, part of that is because, um, you know, we again, we're targeting students that are at at risk. Uh, we know that there is a problem uh, of not enough girls and students of color in STEM. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the mayor says that every job is a STEM job. Uh, every job. And 67% is- mm-hmm. of all uh, STEM jobs are compute related to computing and mm-hmm. coding. Um, and so that it, for us, it's very important um, that students are seen as, again, as leaders and not just the, 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 you know, we, the flashy what, leaders, what like, though. What, the super Mexicans. <laughs> um, you know, okay. but we were super Mexicans. <laughs> I mean, 
you know, but but a lot of students, uh, and I know from my own high school, I I went to high school in San Antonio. Half of my class did not graduate. Yeah. Um, and so you just see so much lost potential, and a lot of it is because of some of deficit thinking yes. about who, not just our students are, but by extension, who our families and our communities are. That's right. Um, so many people will equate IDRA with the work of of um, school finance equity, and it's so easy in the in the year of the endless voucher legislative sessions that we uh, forget where we are in terms of uh, student financing. How does IDRA see it? Are we in a bit? We are in a better place, but are we where we still need to be and what's left to be done when it comes to financial equity in educational opportunity? Yeah, thank you for asking that, um, because we have made incredible gains gains um, because of, of groundbreaking work by organizations like IDRA and MALDA. Um, you know, we are not in the same position um, uh, as we were in the late 60s when students were walking out, but there are still um, many gains to be made. And in fact, we're in a critical moment in public education right now. Uh, we know, uh, we saw with the pandemic, right, how important public schools were um, to, uh, you know, our community from education perspective, public health perspective. I mean, there were centers of our community. Um, and yet there is a, a movement in the United States. Um, I, I call it the Texas three-step. Uh, it, it's a movement to defund, to demonize, and then to privatize public uh, education. And it's all connected, right? So underfunding public schools and then criticizing them for- Not for, doing for better. Failure mm -hmm. or criticizing them, you know, for uh, teaching the wrong, teaching the wrong things and talking about race and gender, right, and then using that to scare um, parents and say, "Here's a private school voucher um, that we're proposing um, that you can take uh, and and get a, an education um, outside of our public schools." And and IDRA is very um, from our from the beginning uh, of our organization has been adamant. We have to keep the public in public schools and in public education. It's a key to democracy. It is a key to democracy. And, you know, the, the legislation in our now fourth not-so-special session <laughs> in the Texas <laughs> Excellent. legislature. Excellent not-so-special section. You know, the, our, our team is, is, leading, um, is, is leading a coalition called um, TLEC, uh, the Texas Legislative Education Equity Coalition, um, you know, one of the things that I think we do well is bring diverse communities together. So business leaders, um, policymakers, K through 12 educators and school board members together with higher ed folks, um, because, you know, all coming together around the common uh, mission, which is to ensure that our, our students can attend public schools that are, are well funded. And what is happening right now with the proposals um, to to take um, you know, what will end up being billions of dollars out of public education um, is is just, um, it's discriminatory um, and it is a huge disservice to um, to our young people uh, and they deserve better. And, and so our, our team, um, you know, now we, we work um, and, and make connections across the U.S. South. So in Georgia, IDRA led a coalition to help stop the expansion of vouchers in that state, um, and we and they you were and they were successful, and right? We were successful, and we will not you know stop working with our partners. Um, we're gonna we have to come back for seven special sessions. We we will be here uh, because it is just that important. Um, I want you to talk about as we wrap up here. We only get thirty minutes with you, Selena. We could do many hours, but. Um, not only to talk about the future of IDRA, but also I want you to address maybe what's a rhetorical question, and that is, why is Texas so anti-education? So when I think about the future, I, you know, I, I think about young people um, really coming into their own and not just demanding, you know, I think the walkouts were demanding quality schools, but I think the young people today 
are are demanding quality schools where they don't have to leave their gender identity or their language or their cultural identity behind. Um, and it's very powerful, right? It, it's, you know, we want to be our authentic selves when we're coming into our schools. And young people are leading, again, they always have, young people have always led movements. They led in 68 and they're leading now. And I think that scares people, um, some people that are holding on to power. Um, public schools and education for many of our families has been always been um, uh, the the lever of generational change for our families and our, our communities. Um, you know, but we still see so much work to be done. San Antonio is still very economically segregated. Um, you know, it's still one of the, the poorest uh, big cities in the country. And mm -hmm. so we have a lot, a long way to go. Uh, and I think these young people know that and, and they are demanding better. But I think, um, one of the reasons why that Texas three step, you know, the, the defunding, demonizing and privatizing is happening is the same reason, right? It's connected to why, um, the state is also trying to suppress voting rights. They're trying to hold on to power, um, in, instead of, um, you know, stepping aside to allow, um, the majority, know, the majority of, of our state lead. And, and in Texas, the majority of our students are students of color and mostly Latino, 60, you know, more than 60% Latino. Um, and so I think, um, you know, we work with the coalition of, of students, particularly black and Latino students. Um, and they are just so amazing. And you got to hear from some of them, um, you know, at, at our 50th anniversary celebration, um, but I'm I'm very hopeful when when I see the organizing that they're doing. Me too. Even though this is so depressing, <laughs> a not so special session is depressing. Yeah. Um, but um, I sat at the table with several of the young people who spoke during your event, and I left feeling so optimistic about the future. And I hope that's what. IDRA provides for us steady, sure hand on the data. And so thank you for being with us. Thank you. Dr. Cardenas is never, we call him Doc. <laughs> uh, you know, he, his vision remains. Um, and I think he never gave up on our community. The young people are, you know, don't, aren't going to be up on themselves. We're never going to give up um, that hope. And, and I think you're right. You know, it, it, they provide just so much light for for our future, and um, and we're here to support their work, and we'll we'll continue doing so for another fifty years and beyond. That's right, fifty years. Thank you so much. Thank Anna. you so much. <laughs>